A change in Republican leadership at the Iowa State House. Linda Upmeyer steps down and a new speaker is chosen to take the gavel in the Iowa House. We'll sit down with the incoming House Speaker Pat Grassley on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, October 25 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. When Speaker Linda Upmeyer announced her resignation a few weeks ago, Republican legislators quickly tapped her replacement. It's a familiar name, but perhaps a new face for many Iowans. Pat Grassley is the grandson of U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley. At 36 years old, the younger Grassley is serving his seventh term in the Iowa House, and in January, he'll officially become Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, welcome to Iowa Press. It's yeah. good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Joining us across the table are Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises, and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Mr. Speaker Select, you have accomplished something in 13 years in the House that your grandfather didn't in the 16 <laughs> years that he served in the Iowa House of Representatives. Why do you want this job? I think that my time, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me here today. I do appreciate that. And I think my time in the legislature, especially these last four years as appropriations chair, uh, I really showed the caucus and I tried to lead the caucus in a way where we had input on, you know, probably overly, I was, I was in front of the caucus more than what even they wanted to hear, is trying to keep them in the loop on the budget, making sure they were educated. I feel like it really prepped me well uh, for this new role. You know, we, we've, did, we've done some great things when it comes to the budget, and I tried to always show the caucus that we could lead, and uh, in fact, probably made it look easy at times when it always isn't. And I want to try to bring that same thing to the caucus, not only on the budget, but uh, at all the issues and at a broader level as well. One of the things you told, um many of us, including the two of us on this side of the, of the table in the journalism community, was that you're not interested in running for the U.S. Senate. Are you a Terry Branstead Republican? He never wanted to run for the U.S. <laughs> Senate either. I, I figured we'd get towards the end, Kay, before I got this, you know, the, the Senate questions. I told Aaron the same thing last time I talked to him. Look, and, and my focus is on being speaker, clearly. Uh, I have full expectation that my grandfather is running for re-election, and my job is to focus on the legislature and making sure we not only uh, maintain but grow our majority and pass responsible budgets and uh, a strong policy for the state. But if he didn't run, would you uh, think about it? I, I have full expectation that he is running, and again, my focus is, is on right. this job that's before me. All right, well, let's focus on the legislature yeah. a, a little bit and talk about some issues that may come uh, on your plate. Um, the medical cannabis law that's in place, uh, hit, uh, there are some advocates who feel that it needs to be expanded. Your predecessor, Speaker Upmeyer, um, was a little more hesitant than some, even in your caucus or among Senate Republicans. She was a little more hesitant to expand that program. What's your thoughts on that, and, and might you see some legislation coming yeah. before you that would increase the potency of the product, make more ailments covered? What do you see on that? Point? I think, and you're, you'll probably see this in a lot of answers I give you today, and this isn't to not give you an honest answer, but I told the caucus, and I've been very clear with them from the beginning, and I've worked with them obviously long enough in my other roles, that uh, our caucus is a bottom-up caucus, and I want to hear the input we have to say on that specific issue. Um, I know we have people that are, like you said, that have different positions within even just our House Republican caucus. But what I can tell you is we'll have those conversations within that, find what may, if there is a path uh, to something. I don't know what that path would look like or if there even is that interest, but over the next few months we're developing what I would say would be the uh, priorities of our caucus. So at this point it's probably a little premature for me to give you what that looks like, but um, I, I'm going to do the best that I can to get in front of the caucus, get their input on issues, and make sure that we're uh, representing what we think is uh, good for Iowans. 
So that and that's fair, but you do have the you know you are in a position of authority now. Mm -hmm. If if something if some kind of an expansion were to come from in front of you that the majority of the caucus supports, is that it, something you're open to, look, or is that I, something that look, you like your predecessor listen, you I, would put your thumb on the I, scales? I have been I have been around here long enough. When I don't see a piece of legislation in front of me, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna always err on the side of caution to not say yes I will be in favor or not in favor of something I think that's a responsible thing for me to do in this role obviously I will have to lead the caucus but I don't want to have anything that I would say on a show uh, uh, this far in front of session be construed that I'm trying to force the caucus one way or another on a specific position uh, you're a farmer in addition to being a legislator what kind of farming do you do uh, we we farm 1700 acres near New Hartford corn and soybeans and we raise some cattle um, there are statewide standards for um, hog confinements that were established in the last century, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, you and your colleagues in the Republican-led House have recently adopted statewide standards that put the kibosh on some local ordinances in regards to the minimum wage, the potential for local ordinances on paper, uh, I mean plastic bags. Um, there's now cropping up a debate about wind turbines. Mm -hmm and siting. Do you think uh, that there should be statewide standards for where wind turbines may be located? Mm -hmm. And to that issue, that's probably an issue that's uh, uh, I'm not nearly as familiar with as maybe some of the other ones you've mentioned or some of the ones that will be mentioned here today. Um, my position on that is going to be to uh, find out what the caucus has, if, if any, interest in that issue. And I don't think it's uh, appropriate for me to probably comment on something that because that really isn't one that even is on my radar up until just honestly probably the last few days in talking about being on here today with you. So I'm going to want to be careful in how I answer that, only from the standpoint of uh, something that I really haven't had a lot of conversations about. Well, are wind about. turbines a good idea for Iowa or not? Well, I think clearly that you're going to, uh, with the last name Grassley, I mean, I think there's going to be an expectation uh, of, of supporting wind energy within the state. And I think you're going to see House Republicans have been supportive of renewable energy within, uh, within the state. And I think there's been a lot of success stories. But to this specific uh, issue that we have in front of us, uh, I honestly have not had enough input on that to probably give you a really uh, educated answer. The water quality issue is something that's been before the legislature for a number of years now. You guys passed something, um, I think it's two years ago now, that, that created a, a new funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. There's still the ongoing debate over whether the uh, conservation sales tax should be enacted to provide more funding for that. Um, do you expect to see that debate before your caucus again this year? And, and are you open to something that would include a broader tax increase with the conservation a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to that issue, again, that's going to be another issue that as a caucus, we have members, and it falls back to the other one you have, we have members on that issue that are probably all over the board on that. Um, I think we're kind of, there's a lot of conversations on what potential proposals would be. I think that's something that our caucus would have to see what those proposals look like as we have those conversations moving forward. Um, but at this point, to say, because, again, there's just so many ideas floating around, not only with uh, the, the three-eighths, but the other five and, and how that ties in and then the funding formula that it has. I think there's so many unanswered questions on that. It's very difficult to say that that's an issue that obviously is going to move through the legislature or not. But you do think Iowa has a water quality problem? I don't think. I, I think that the legislature has taken very appropriate steps to try to address the issue of water quality. And it really isn't something that's going to happen overnight. As a farmer, and I've said this for the last several years, I've been involved with the funding mechanism, obviously, as appropriations chair when it comes to water quality. Um, when you look at that issue, this isn't just a urban or, or rural issue, and that's why the program that we set up tried to provide resources not only to rural Iowa, but also urban Iowa as well. And a lot of these practices, I use an example in our area. In our township, I would say almost every bean that's planted is done no-till, and no-till is one of those things that you, you want to see uh, that's trying to be promoted with some of these programs that we've implemented. And a lot of that happened not because of government programs, but because somebody was willing to invest in those uh, pieces of equipment, try something different. And this strategy is really trying to encourage landowners and farmers to try some of these new practices, uh, buffer strips, uh, cover crops. And I, I really think that we've been proactive, and it isn't something that's going to happen overnight, whether the government says you will do this or you, you aren't going to do it this way. I think the way of doing it is education and people in the communities and the leaders in the areas uh, uh, leading on some of those changes. So I'm just old enough to remember the gas tax debate uh, of a few years ago here and how difficult that was to get passed. Even for something 
an issue that has bipartisan support like infrastructure in that case or water quality in this case. How tough it is, is it to get something passed that includes raising taxes? Well, I think as a whole, I think you're going to see our caucus always err on the side of caution. I mean, uh, any time we've had the opportunity to try to give those taxpayer dollars back to Iowans and put them in their hands because they know how to spend them better than, in my opinion, than the government does, we're going to try to take those opportunities as well. So when it comes to just saying, you know, that's why I, it's hard to answer the question when it comes to the three eighths and the whole thing, because what does it really look like? Is it an overall tax increase? Is it an overall uh, net neutral? There's so many unanswered questions when it comes to that issue. Um, it's, it's very difficult to answer it. You're, you're from New Hartford. Can, in, on this water quality issue, this, this has, is an urban-rural divide in our state. Can you assure urban Iowans that they'll get a fair hearing? You're not just a legislator from New Hartford anymore. You're going to be a, a speaker of the Iowa House. Can, can Iowans who live in urban areas feel assured that they're going to fair hearing from you on this issue? One of our priorities when it came to the water quality issue in the bill that we passed and what we've been working on, like I said earlier, uh, specifically outlined ways that you could help urban Iowa as well as rural Iowa to admit. I, I do not think that there's any solution in trying to pit one group against each other, especially on the issue of water quality. Um, I think that's an issue we have to try to address. Uh, you know, as a state, we're really trying to address that. And that's why in the funding mechanisms that we've set up in some of the programs, it's gone to both, so that way neither one of the sides felt like there was any blame that we need to do this together as Iowans. The legislature has taken several steps toward trying to improve the mental health system mm -hmm. in Iowa, and this tax increase, which we've been talking about, an increase in the sales tax, has been looked at at perhaps one way of financing that system, mm -hmm. which is currently financed largely by property taxpayers. Is that part of uh, an agenda item that Republicans will give serious consideration to? I would, again, not trying to be difficult, mm -hmm. but there are so many options floating around with what that five, especially that five eighths, mm -hmm. and, and that isn't even all of it. You know, we got to remember, still, there's still a lot of folks that are trying to figure out what the three eighths in that current formula would go to. So to sit here and say, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the answer, I suppose, is that's being discussed uh, as far as one of the options, but I don't even know if the level of, uh, of support would even exist within the caucus to do the first three eights or the last five eights, I, you know, that really is uh, something that uh, would have to be ironed out through different proposals. Over the past few years, you've been involved in an in-depth look at tax credits. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate action in regards to changing the, the full buffet, if you will, of tax credits that are currently offered in Iowa? Well, you're going to see next week we have our first meeting of the Tax Review Committee. So in mm -hmm. the tax legislation that we passed, uh, we laid out that that had to happen. So we're going to be having our first meeting coming up here next week. Um, and I really look at this as an opportunity for us to have a conversation. Now, from the bill that I originally had filed that I, uh, when I was appropriations chair, um, it was a pretty broad bill, and it took a bit, and took a pretty big look. Was, I would say one of the bigger looks that we have at property, or excuse me, at tax credits in a long time. And uh, while that only made it out of committee, it didn't go any further. I think it really started the conversation because this isn't all about just going in and just taking a big whack at every tax credit, uh, credit and going across the board and just eliminating everything. We have to be very specific in what we're doing. Can we look at some of the credits that currently exist? Can they be doing better? Uh, can they can they be modified so that way they're working for today's economy? Because a lot of these uh, uh, tax credits that exist, back to Aaron's comment, probably even go back before your time, which that's a long time ago. And some of them probably even go back to that far. Um, and so I think we have to, as a legislature, not just go in and say, okay, everybody's going to be cut, but everybody needs to be looked at when we're making these decisions. And I think this opportunity from this tax review committee, we've already been hearing as legislators and myself that's interested in this issue, we've been hearing from folks like, hey, you know, after this, after this committee gets going, we may have some suggestions to some of our credits or, you know, how they maybe could work more efficiently or, or be more responsible. There's one credit which um, has drawn a lot of attention because it's a, a check that's sent to many mm -hmm. large corporations. It's the research activities tax credit and it sort of erases uh, the tax liability for some of the largest um, businesses in Iowa, and they exactly. And in addition to that, they get a check from the state. Is that the number one? So as I approach this, I shouldn't say I approach it, but being on the committee, mm -hmm. I, I look at it that way. As the committee's approaching it, I don't think we have any that we're going into that with 
saying, okay, before we even have input, we're going to just start whacking at them. That's not, that's not what the intention would be of the committee. I will tell you that we need to have a fair hearing on all of them and we need to be willing to look at all of them. Now remember, part of the reason we found ourselves in the situation that we have, um, which is having, a, having uh, uh, quite a few tax credits, that isn't a Republican or a Democrat problem. We've all voted for almost every one of those. A lot of that happened when we had split control of government and instead of being able to actually just over, lower the overall tax rates, um, the common ground was found through tax credits. Is it possible in an election year to be eliminating tax credits? I, I mean, I've been around a while too, and I've seen this movie before. Yeah, we all want to get rid of tax credits, but when you get one up and, and start yeah. talking about doing away with it, the special interest groups I, hone in, and especially in an election year when you're asking those same interest groups for contributions. Well, is this realistic to expect I, I anything can at all? I can tell you if there's anyone in the legislature that knows uh, whether you have one or 20 on the list, what, uh, what, what, what comes, to, comes your way as far as groups. What I can tell you is, the, again, uh, we're not out to try to just dismantle every tax credit. That's not the intention we're trying to do. I think there's a lot of them uh, and, and to, uh, that we probably can look at and say, okay, could this money be spent better doing something else with? Could we repurpose it and try to use it in a different manner? Um, I I don't want to, I don't want uh, uh, folks that are have interest in tax credits to think that just because we're having a review committee meet that that means that we're just going to start eliminating credits. One more question on this: um, the Tax Foundation this week. This is sort of the flip side of this issue. The Tax Foundation, a, a, a national group, came out with a study this week. Said Iowa was one of the worst states for business. And the way that usually gets fixed is handing out more tax credits. So what are you going to do when a group like that says we're one of the worst places in the country to do business? And I think you've seen that, uh, how, how Republicans have reacted to that in the past few years, trying to lower not only individual but uh, other rates as well. We've tried to address that issue, but it also comes back to, again, to where, the way I answered Kay, Qua, Kay's question would be that we've also got ourselves in the situation because we could never find compromise to try to address that overall sticker. You know, everyone co talks about that in economic development. They see that postcard that says, Iowa ranks this, this, and this. And then when you dig into it, there's a lot of other uh, issues. You know, there's other credits that they may qualify for. So it's a, it's a difficult balancing act. And when we've had the opportunity to reduce the tax burden on Iowans, we've always done that. Maybe there's some credits that can be used to try to uh, lower the overall burden. Um, and that's just one of the things I think we're going to look at Speaking as we do it. issues, we have a lot more to ask you about, Aaron. So, so one of the most debated issues during the last session was about the change, proposed changes to the judicial nominating process. Um, it settled on a compromise uh, that uh, only altered one of the positions, ga gave an extra spot to the governor. Are House Republicans comfortable with that comp compromise? Uh, the original bill went a little farther than that. Are House Republicans comfortable with that, or might we see another bite at the apple on that this session? I think that you, I think that between now, like many other issues between now and when session starts, uh, our caucus is going to have a lot of conversations about several of the issues, probably most of the issues that you asked me here today, because again, that's been what I've made very clear to the caucus is how I want to operate, is making sure that we have their input. How can we build consensus on issues, um, not only during the legislative session, but make sure that we're prepared going into the legislative session. So I, I would say at this point in time, um, there will be conversation within our caucus uh, about that issue and several others that I'm sure we talk what, about today. What about the issue of redistricting reform? Iowa has a law. A lot of people, uh, uh, Democrats particularly, are afraid Republicans are going to come in and try to change that law so that they can gerrymander the state. Uh, You're going to touch the redistricting I've law? I've been very clear that I will not support changing the redistricting. If anyone, I, I went through probably the most expensive primary as a sitting legislature that anyone's ever been a part of. If anyone had any problems with it, I feel like I probably could qualify for that. Um, but I don't think we should change the process. We have a good process in the state, and I don't... I, those, those concerns, I think, have been greatly overblown. I don't know, uh, again, from my opinion, I do not support those changes. The House last year um, passed a proposed constitutional amendment that would restore felon voting rights automatically, something Governor Reynolds has been championing. It went over to the Senate and sort of stalled, um, and they are thinking about tinkering with it a little. Does the House like the version it passed, or do you anticipate negotiations to come up with something different? Uh, I've not had that conversation with the Senate as far as whether we would come up with something different, but obviously um, we're willing to have those with the Senate as they're trying to um, 
figure out what, what level of comfort they could have with that bill or if they have to make changes to it. So we're, we're more than happy to have those conversations, not only with the Senate, but obviously, like you said, the governor looking at as one of um, uh, her leading issues. Uh, I would say that you know she'll obviously be involved in those conversations as well. She also this week um, established a working group to come up with a series of proposals for criminal justice reform mm -hmm. with an eye toward addressing the uh, disparities in racial sentencing among blacks and whites in Iowa. Is that something that you think legislators are willing to tackle in an election year? I would say that I, I, I don't see that as an issue that would be something our caucus would just immediately back away from. I think, again, you know, we're, we're going to have a lot of issues in our caucus that try to address issues that um, aren't necessarily just one specific type of thing. You know, we look at it, for example, uh, and I, the reason I say this is hopefully this will help uh, with some of your other questions that you may have. I don't want to knock any off your list, so I don't mean <laughs> to do that. But, you know, when it comes to our caucus and the conversations we have had, I can tell you the issues that we have before us. You know, there's there. it's going to be things like workforce. I mean, we're going to have issues. The governor's led on that issue as far as workforce travel all over the state. Our caucus is interested in issues like that. Our caucus is going to be interested in issues of, of child care, not just access, but affordability. That's, again, some of those issues that our caucus is going to be looking at um, and leading on are, aren't going to be those what I would consider to be controversial issues. They're going to be the kind of issues that I think are good for all of Iowans and our growth moving forward. Okay. Well, speaking of one of those issues, uh, let's talk a little bit about the state budget. Uh, you know, House Republicans have felt good about the budget proposals they've put forward in the past. First, just real quick, will you remain budget chair or as speaker, will you delegate that to someone else? <laughs> Uh, I don't think I don't think I have the mental capacity uh, at this point in time to be able to handle both roles. No, I kid. No, I I I will. There will be a new appropriations chair. And who will it be? I will be making that announcement. I would say fairly soon. All right. So there's a surplus right now. Uh, what kind of discussion do you expect to have within your caucus about what to do that with that? There's always people who are anxious to get a little extra funding boost when there's a when there's a budget surplus. Public education has raised concerns about underfunding both at the K-12 and the Regents level with tuition costs. Is that a possibility for some of this extra money that's in the budget now? You got to you got to be careful having the for, well the I guess still current appropriations chair on to start talking about the budget. We your time might be up after I get done with this one, Aaron. But no, I kid. Uh, so when it comes to the budgeting, and and again, we have been. I feel like House Republicans. That's something that we know when we show up in session. That's what we have to do. These other issues that we talk about get discussed with our caucus, but we lead on that budget issue. I feel like that's something that um, we spend so much time on because we've you know we've been entrusted with the taxpayer dollars and we take that job very seriously. Keep in mind when we talk about you know our caucus uh, you know has been burned from having to come back in halfway through the uh, fiscal year and have to make deappropriations. I will tell you that that is a part of when we make the budget decisions. Part of why we're fairly cautious and conservative when we make those decisions. It only takes the revenue estimating conference being off by two percent, which two percent really isn't that much when you think about an estimate of a seven and a half billion dollar budget. Them being off two percent, that's hundred over one hundred and fifty million dollars. Right there, you've already just uh, uh, taken that number in half just because of a, an inaccurate estimate. And we still don't even have the December estimate at this point, when which we'll form our budget off of. Um, so I don't look at that as something we're going to go out and just say, how are we going to spend this? It's going to be a continued conservative approach to the budgeting because, uh, again, I would much rather have to be responsible uh, in the front end than to have to come in when the revenue wasn't meeting expectations and having to make those deappropriations. Our caucus, I don't think, wants to have to go through that again. Uh, it was very, that was very difficult, and we obviously got through it. Um, but we would rather err on the side of caution. Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitver, a Republican from Ankeny, who's your counterpart in the Senate, uh, made clear at the end of this past 2019 legislative session that on the docket for 2020 would be welfare reform because Republicans are hearing from their constituents um, that are raising concerns. Um, what sort of concerns are you hearing from voters about uh, welfare? Yeah, and I think, and, and as I've, uh, like we've talked about uh, 
earlier before we started. I've been traveling all over, and, and that issue does continue to come up. I think what you're going to see from House Republicans, obviously the Senate, uh, you know, they have some members that have really been working on this issue, and I know that we have members that have been reaching out to them, trying to find out where we could uh, possibly make some of these changes. It's very difficult um, dealing with some of those programs. It's not as simple as just passing a bill at the state level um, that just allows you to make all the changes you want to make. You know, you, some of that has to be approved and things. So we'll have those conversations with the Senate. But you're you're saying something is possible then? I think that I I, I don't Likely? see a sin. No, I would not say. I I again. Hopefully, you've 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 learned from uh, my approach on how I plan on uh, operating a speaker. I would want to have more input from the caucus on an issue like that. But I know we have members like several other issues that we've talked about today that would be interested in something like that and would be willing to talk with the Senate about what they're looking at. We've got just a, a, a few seconds left. Suburban women. Republicans have not done well in elections recently, particularly in the House. What are you going to do to reach out to suburban women in the coming campaign? Well, I think, again, back to the couple issues that I touched on, I think what you're going to see from our caucus, because I think there is going to try to be this narrative that there is an urban versus uh, rural Iowa divide, and I don't see that to be the case on how House Republicans plan on governing. You're going to see us leading on issues that we hear about. I was just in Black Hawk County last night, my neighboring county right next to me, and the issues of child care came up, workforce. We're going to be addressing uh, and trying to tackle some of those big issues that affect all of Iowans and our success. And Mr. Speaker, we're out of time for now. I hope as the session goes on, we can have you back to talk in more detail as you yeah, put I look your plans together. I look forward to it. All right, thanks for being Thank with you. us. And we'll be back next week for another edition of Iowa Press when we sit down with New Jersey Senator and Democratic presidential hopeful Cory Booker. He'll be one of many candidates hitting the campaign trail in Iowa next weekend. That's Cory Booker on Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen. And thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.